In a previous video, we talked about T cells. Let's talk about B cells. B cells. Some of its function, we said that it will, with your macrophages, take any foreign antigen and go to your T cells, present it to your T cells. Say, hey, something's abnormal here. So it works as an antigen presenter cell. We also said that it makes immunoglobulins. Another word for immunoglobulins is antibodies. So it makes antibodies. All right? Those are your IgG, IgE, IgM, all that stuff. So it makes those antibodies. And then lastly, a subgroup will kind of stay in the shadows, make memory cells, so that the next time you encounter the same pathogens, it'll pop up and say, I've dealt with this before, I know exactly what to do, activate your immune system that much faster. So it makes memory cells. So your B cells are incredibly important. They are incredibly important. Let's talk about the first function, antigen presenting cells. So here's your B cell as an antigen presenting cell. And do antigen presenting cells have MHC1 or MHC2? You tell me. If you said MHC2, you'd be absolutely correct. So they load up an antigen, endogenous or exogenous? Exogenous, right. They load it up and they present it to your T cells, CD4 or CD8. If you remember the rule of eight, you know CD4. Four times two equals eight. All right, four times two equals eight. And it will receive that, and that'll be your first signal. But you know by now that to activate your T cells, you need more than just one signal. You need two signals. And what's the second signal? That would be B7, activating CD28. So your CD4 says, I got my two signals. I got my co-stimulatory signal. I'm happy. I will activate. Makes T helper one, T helper two. What's T helper one release? This is like a recap of our last video, right? If you said interferon gamma, you'd be right. What does T-helper 2 release? If you said IL-4, you'd be right. What does that do? It does a lot of things, but because we're talking about B cells here, it induces IgE, IgG. IL-5 does a lot of things, but because we're talking about B cells here, induces IgA. And then IL-10, which decreases inflammation, but we're not gonna talk about it here. So. Your T cells activating are very, very important in sw class switching and changing antibodies, right? So that's your T cell activating. Well, how about your B cells? Your B cells want to activate. Your B cells need to activate. Your B cells need to activate to make antibodies in the first place, to make memory cells in the first place, right? So it needs to activate. How does it do that? Well, it will present to your CD4. That will be your first signal. Okay? But it needs a different signal. So your CD4 helpers will Say, I got you, I got your back, I'll give you a signal. And it does this with CD40 ligand. And it activates CD40 of your B cells. And that activates your B cells. That's your second signal that activates your B cells. That's something you gotta know. That is how your B cells activate. So the first signal is your MHC2 binding to your CD4. Second signal is your CD40 ligand binding to CD40 of your B cells. It will create your antibodies, it will create your memory cells. We're gonna talk about antibodies now. Let's talk about antibodies now. Antibodies have this kind of structure, right? And they will recognize foreign antigens and they will bind to it like this. And when it binds to it, it does different things. It can activate complements. Activate complements, which we'll talk about in our next video. It can signal macrophages to phagocytose. Right? If your macrophages come in and see something that's just covered in antibodies, then it knows for sure that is something that I don't want there. That's something I need to phagocytose. So it signals macrophages to phagocytose it. And then lastly, it neutralizes this foreign antigen. Let's say that foreign antigen is very immunogenic, very antigenic. If it touches a human cell receptor, it causes an incredible inflammation, inflammatory response. But we don't want that. So if we bind on top of it, cover it, we can neutralize it. So your antibodies, your immunoglobulins are very, very important. And the more times it's exposed to that same antigen, the stronger and the better it'll get. We call that affinity maturation. Affinity maturation. That makes sense. The more times you do something, don't you get better at it? Your antibodies are the exact same. Now let's look at the structure in a little bit more detail. You have this heavy 
chain, this really large, heavy chain. And then you have this smaller, light chain. Smaller, light chain. So I'll write heavy, I'll write light. And they're bound, everything's bound together with disulfide bonds, disulfide bonds. Okay. At the end of your light chain, it is super variable. So if you take two immunoglobulins, these variable regions are probably gonna be different, right? They're very, very variable. So all right, variable. And you want them to be variable. You want your immunoglobulins to be variable and different because bacteria are constantly changing, constantly evolving. You want a very diverse group of immunoglobulins to attack it, all right? To attack it, to recognize it. Now this first, this top portion, this top fragment binds to antigens. We call this the FA B portion, FAB. Called FAB because it's the antigen binding fragment. All right, so binds antigens. I mean, just look at our picture. Doesn't this top portion, this top Y portion, bind this antigen? Right? So it binds the antigen. And because it's this top portion, it contains your heavy chain, contains your light chain, so it's both heavy and light. And it contains this variable region, variable. And like I said, you want it to be variable, you want diversity because this is the thing that binds the antigen and antigens are always changing, always evolving. So you need a diverse group, a diverse top fragment to bind that diverse antigen. How do we make it diverse? Well, the heavy chain has a portion called the V portion and the DJ portion. The light chain has a portion called the V portion, called the J portion. And by kind of recombinating these, uh, I hope that's a word, recombination of these, then you can make it super, super variable, super, super diverse. That's what we want. We want some diversity. We want some diversity. So, all right, recombination of the heavy V, DJ, or the light VJ segments. You might have seen that or heard of that. Now you know what it means. You see, you have genes that code for these segments. Looks kind of like this, where V stands for variable region. D stands for diversity. J stands for joining. And if you remember, recombination basically means like you're shuffling genes around. You're shuffling these genes around. And because you're shuffling these genes around, then the top portion gets very diverse, is able to uh, match the, gets very diverse and is able to match and bind antigens. That's your FAB portion. And if that isn't enough, if recombination isn't enough, you have this enzyme called TDT, which randomly inserts nucleotides. It says, hey, you're not diverse enough, I'm gonna throw random nucleotides at you to make you even more different. More different. All right, so that's your FAB portion, the top portion. Let's talk about this bottom portion, this bottom fragment. We call this your FC fragment. Now, they call it your FC fragment for many different reasons. FC, C can stand for constant region. It can stand for complement because this is where your complements bind. It can stand for crystallizable. You don't need to know why. Any way you cut it, you need to be able to recognize that this bottom portion is gonna be your FC portion. Right? And this only has this heavy chain, right? We're not touching the light chain, so this only has heavy chains. And there's a little side group at the end that are made of carbohydrates, so it has carbohydrate side groups. That's just some anatomy you should be aware of. So complements will actually bind kind of at this joint region. So our complements. And then here at the bottom, macrophages will bind to the FC region. So you bind complements and macrophages. Again, if we look at our diagram, complements will come in here and get activated. 
this kind of joint line. And then macrophages will see this and say, I need to eat this for sure. And we'll attach right here on the bottom, right here on the bottom. Probably the most important fact that you need to know about the FC portion is that if you switch out this FC portion, then you can change the immunoglobulin. You can change it from IgM to IgG, to IgG to IgA, IgE to IgA. So this determines the type of immunoglobulins. We call that isotype. It determines the isotype. All right, if you change the FC portion, you determine the isotype. If you change the top portion, the FAB type, you change the idiotype. You change what type of antigen it binds to, but you don't really change the immunoglobulin itself. We call that the idiotype. So that is the anatomy of your immunoglobulins. Now we've been around the bush, let's talk about the different types of immunoglobulins. All of them start with the basic structure, this Y structure. All of them start like that. Some might not end like that, but they all start like that. They all start as monomers. And by default, by default, they are IgM and Ig. D. They only start to switch when your B cells are activated via your CD40, and they only start to switch when they recognize cytokines that tell them to switch. Then we go through some. So this will switch it through to IgG and IgE. This will switch it to IgA. So you cover all your bases. These are all the five types of immunoglobulins. And now you know how we make them, and now you know how we switch them. Perfect. So we'll talk about IgM first. <clears throat> IgM starts off as a monomer, as everything starts off as a monomer on your B cell, and once it's secreted into your plasma, it will combine with four other ones and make a pentamer. A pentamer joined by something called a J chain. So it joins together, makes this giant pentamer kind of flies through the blood. This is massive thing. And it's so massive and it has so many arms that it can pick up things right away. So it is seen in acute, acute response. It's great at being the first thing to pick it up. Now your IgM is so huge that it can't cross uh, the placenta. So if you're pregnant, and you have a baby and you want to pass some immunoglobulins to kind of help your baby's immune system, you can't pass IgM. It's just too massive, too massive. So I say, can't cross placenta. Cool. Next up, IgG, your IgG. Now this can't cross a placenta and it is the most abundant in the serum kind of in your blood. And your IgM is very important for delayed response. So someone with a chronic condition or if they have a condition that you picked up three months later, what kind of immunoglobulin do you expect to see? IgG. IgG. The fact that it crosses the placenta is very, very important <clears throat> because again, you can pass that, those antibodies to your baby, kind of help its immune system, but by six months, the immunoglobulins will decrease and the baby will kind of be all on its lonesome. But by that first, that first six months, it really appreciates your health. So you can cross the placenta, that's something that's been asked a lot. A lot. I've seen it on a lot of board questions. So let's move on to IgD. IgD, what does that do? I don't know. Nobody knows. IgA, let's move on. <laughs> no, seriously, nobody really knows. So don't, don't really worry about it. The only thing you need to know about IgD is that it is one of the default ones. One of the default ones. IgA found in your mucous membrane. So that is your, your nose, rest tract, your GIT tract, all that stuff. It's also found in secretions. So your tears, your breast milk. <clears throat> so you can pass it on to your baby. Now, not everyone can breastfeed. So not everyone can pass on IgA, but everyone can pass on IgG just by default, just by having a baby. So be careful. You might say they have a baby. Do you, are you guaranteed that they're gonna have the maternal IgA? No, what if the mom doesn't breastfeed, all right? So just know that, but know that it loves your mucous membranes, loves uh, your, any secretory uh, fluids, like your tears, like your breast milk. And know that it is the most abundant, but not in serum, yeah. It's stuck in your snot or stuck in your tears, all right? So it's the most fun, just not in the serum. The most fun in the serum is your IgG. And the last thing you need to know is that it starts as a monomer, as everything, but when it ends, 
it ends as a dimer. That is probably one of the most important things about that GA. And then last but not least, IgE. Lowest concentration, it binds mast cells and activates eosinophils. So it's very important for parasites and for atopic diseases. So it can bind mast cells, can cross them with other mast cells and cause them to release histamine. And you can get a lot of signs that you see in atopic disease. We'll talk about that in our next video. So that's all you need to know about B cells, how they're activated, what they do, what they create, and then a little bit of anatomy on uh, antibodies. Right. Hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks.